and like I really um, looked up to people who were so confident, you know, and they were very and they were very assertive and they were aggressive and they wanted to convince you that what they're saying is true. Hi and welcome to Someone You Should Meet. Today we're in Denmark as part of a series where we check in with people around the globe just to see how the coronavirus is impacting their daily lives. And today my guest is Derek Pardew, who is a professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, he's a professor of global studies there. Hi, thank you so much for joining me, Derek. Hi, Claire. Um, nice how to meet you? you. I'm yes, okay. Yes, nice to meet you. Yeah, good. How are you? How's the family? Um, everybody's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a rainy day today, which is really normal, except it's been incredibly warm here. And um, I feel like I'm kind of coming back to like the conventional Denmark. Um, but I mean, everything's fine. Everything's okay. Denmark, um, you know, is people are out and about. People are getting, they're very antsy to be outside. So um people want to get back to some sort of normalized routine um, and you can feel that like when you're around yeah i was reading a report that said that a lot of people you have good weather so they're out in the parks and, and kind of socializing in that um in that kind of fashion but also schools have reopened haven't they primary schools how is all of that going right so that was the big news um a little less than a week ago well, I guess a week ago. I started a week ago on Monday. I can, it's hard to keep the day straight. Um, but yeah, it was a week ago and they started so strategically with some schools. Um, not all the schools were prepared or were like deemed proper to open, to reopen, but some did. And also from the parents' point of view, like one of my colleagues, she has a, a three and a half year old uh, daughter and she decided not to. And many, many, um, you know, did the same thing. They, they took on their own decision not to send their kids back, and I can understand why. Um, but yeah, so sort of like uh, strategically, um, things have reopened. There's some shops that have reopened as well, um, like hair salons. I went into a like a natural food store to buy vitamins and that was open um, so this has been in, so we're in a new phase but I will say that um, on, and I was telling this to Eddie the other day that on Friday night I took a ride uh, rode my bike in the downtown at night about 10 or something 10 or 11 at night and there was really nothing open so no bars or anything like that um and no restaurants only some things where you just take out right take away i should say because i'm in europe so i'm supposed to say take away that's funny um <laughs> okay so like generally speaking then what is the um the consensus amongst you know like your friends and family are you wanting the country to reopen or are you a bit nervous about kind of going straight into something like that I personally am a little bit uh, nervous. Um, I think that, you know, it's very, it depends on, you know, your livelihood. I mean, we see that all around the, all around the world. Some people, you know, their livelihoods depend on working and they're, they're forced to make certain um, risk assessments. And then there's other people who are like business owners and they're really getting antsy and they're losing so much money. I mean, I'm extremely fortunate and privileged that I work at home. I work from home a lot anyway. Um, education is something that, you know, lends itself at least partially to a lot of online stuff. And we've been, you know, all of my colleagues, and I have gotten somewhat proficient at Zoom and all kinds of other online software that's that's been out there for a while but of course now everybody knows something about zoom 
Um, yeah, that's funny. Me included. <laughs> yeah, Although so. uh, Edward, uh, my producer, and I were still trying to figure it out some days. Um, the interesting thing is um, the primary schools in Denmark have started to reopen, uh, but not secondary schools and older kids, because um, I think the reason I read uh, for that is because they are more proficient at being able to work from home, um, which mm -hmm. is something I was going to talk to you about. How has this like impacted on your job as a, as a professor? Right. So, um, right. So, I mean, so from my point of view as a professor, um, you know, we we had this couple of weeks where everyone got uh, they had to familiarize us, ourselves and do some intense um, learning through Blackboard and Zoom's interface with Blackboard, which is our main platform for online instruction. Um, which before had only just been sort of like a Dropbox or maybe some kinds of dialogue activities, but never really, you know, in real time. So then, you know, it was a new kind of conception and how to, not just how to share slides, but, you know, how to engage students when sometimes you can see them, sometimes you can't. And now, you know, there's all kinds of protocol of hand raising and, and things like um, now uh, it's very difficult to whole like leave your mic on or mute it because it, it affects the quality of the discourse, you know? So how does that work? And um, I mean, again, I've been fortunate not only because I don't have to like go into some store or on the streets to make my living, but I also, this particular semester was very light for me. So I've only just been having very small group conversations about at the graduate level and with like people like advising um, different theses. So for me personally, it's been <laughs> much easier than even some of my colleagues. And they're not even to imagine beyond that, like other kinds of professions. But I also have another, perspective just as a father so my son he's 15 and so I've been seeing his experience as you know like a high school student um, doing his homework online and how different instruct different professors for like chemistry or French and English different um, topics how they've approached this online learning and it's quite a spectrum like what people expect from the students, what's realistically possible? What are the glitches, you know? And I've been kind of seeing that through his experience. And how are you adapting to that? Um, well, I mean, we talk about like, which, which subjects um, is this lending itself better or which professors are more savvy? And it has an impact because sometimes, uh, the professor thinks that the student should be able to do exactly what they were doing before. And like in terms of content or quantity, um, but doesn't allow for certain, there's just certain gaps of like what you, how you can do a lab, like a chemistry lab, I mean. You know, yeah, I, I mean, know. I hear you, I, I hear you, Jack. <laughs> I I thought, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, so I've got two daughters. They're, they're younger than yours, and they're still in elementary school. I've got mm. a sixth grader, so she's in a last year of elementary school, and then a third grader. Um, and I agree with you. I think, you know, overall, they've adapted pretty well. Um, but I just feel that they are still missing out on certain things. There are certain things that I just can't recreate for them. Um, I mean, do you feel like that? Like your son's kind of missing out a little bit, not being actually at school? Oh, no doubt. I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I mean. I see it really in my son because, uh, I mean, the social and the social part of it is so important. I mean, and you just can't recreate that through online relationships. You just can't do it. And I mean, I'm feeling it myself with colleagues here at Orhus, but also my colleagues, you know, through the different disciplines that I've Part, you know, in which I participate, and just like I mean, all academics and scholars are feeling this um, 
pinch, like a kind of existential thing because we travel quite a bit like conferences and we're doing especially people who do social research so we're doing field work and like it's like how am i supposed to do that now and like these people who i i'm really friendly with um it's just you know you can have your cocktail zoom cocktails but it's just not the same <laughs> and so i'm feeling that he my son andre is also experiencing that as well um especially because he was just feeling like he was getting into like a rhythm at this new school for him so oh yeah yes. I, you. I, mean, <laughs> so, I feel really missing the social aspect yeah. as well and like how are you managing to kind of like help him and like do your work and and you know how's your wife coping with that too yeah um so we've all been we've had some collaborative activities so Yes, so I, my wife, Selma, and Andre, we have some things that we do together. We created Spotify playlists. We did that for a while where, like, we took keywords, out of whether it's quarantine or something, and we made, we made these playlists, and they would be sort of the evening entertainment for that day, or often it spilled into a couple of days. We did that. We created some, um, like, must see movies or movies that we want to see that we would like to see um and we've been going we're about halfway through our list on that um then there's stuff that then we have our own individual projects right and we go into our little corners of the apartment and deal with that and um uh, what i was going to say was um I mean, my, my son is, um, he's super into music and like super into um, basketball and football, like soccer, football, football. And of course, all the sports has been a massive gap. Like it's just been, you know, there's nothing. It's deleted like from your ex experience. And this is one reason I think why people are flocking to see this new documentary about the the 97, 98 Chicago Bulls, the last dance, because nobody, there's no basketball to see. So everyone's just like watching this thing from a team that's over 20 years ago, you know, okay, what are they really gonna tell me anything new about that? But we're watching it anyway, you know. But yeah. beyond the sports, right, it's it's all about, for my son, he writes music reviews. So he, um, you know, right now people are still, um, Music is one of those things that you can still do, you know, a lot of people do Facebook lives, but if people are recording and people are, Spotify is so, I mean, it's just so um, productive. It's just like every day, there's so many albums being dropped and he's constantly consuming it and then like evaluating it. And there's all kinds of uh, platforms from um, on which he can, upload his reviews and converse or at least eavesdrop on what other people are saying about x album you know i think so he's doing a lot of that um i think it's good because it's a lot about a composition and articulation and how do you describe sound which is very difficult for anyone to do um so these are things that he's doing so he does enough to do his online homework and he's kind of he does that but then what he really enjoys is this his music reviews right now and um, for me um i am in the middle of this research project that um that was here in orcus that's about the city at night and that's why i was bike riding that's one of the reasons i wrote it through the downtown areas um on friday night was to see if anybody or how people are socializing at night and um the only thing since the indoor places are closed um there's a little river that goes through waters and there are um a lot of built environments for people to hang out and so you i took some pictures of it even on my cell phone was very poor to take pictures at night but at least it captured these like little groupings 
So you'd have like four or five people, and then like, I know, good, you know, six, seven meters, and then another little group, and another little group. And that's what people are doing at night. Um, so anyway, I was doing field work about how particularly young Muslims uh, navigate, how they engage with the city at night. And I've um, been adapting to the new reality. And um, so what I've done is, along with the research assistant, we've developed an, a website, like an interactive platform, asking people to drop a line, share an image, share a short video about places they like to go at night, like. Like, what's your favorite place in Aarhus? What's a place where you don't feel comfortable? And how do you think about the future? What could, how could we make Aarhus better, like more inclusive? You know, so we feel better, more comfortable to enjoy the city. And then one last little activity is for people to draw like their maps, for, like a kind of mapping exercise, where they go, where they like to go. You can insert little uh, icons of bikes or pets or trees or whatever like that. And so in this way, I'm trying to um, get data. I would normally do through field work, work chatting with people and stuff um, in this way, kind of interactive platform. So that's what I've been doing. Um, we've all been, and my, my wife, she is, um, she produces content online for Brazilian educators, like pedagogy. So it's for Brazilian teachers, like different ways to think about approaching the classroom. So she's been busy also adapting what kinds of messages she wants to send and how to adapt to a new, to a new reality as well. Okay, so Derek, um Edward, my producer's just got a um, an image now. Oh, this is Airhus, isn't it? So, how yes. does this compare to the Airhus that you know you're kind of interested in? Well, um, so of course, it doesn't surprise me that I'm sure this is this is taken in July or something like that. Like everywhere, like any time you see anything about Denmark, it's always in July or August when there is some real sun. Yeah, just like in the UK. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'm sure you're familiar with some of those scenes where it's just like so cloudy and the sun never comes out and it's so dark for weeks. Yeah. So, of course, they yeah. don't show any of that. And they should have so they don't show any of that. Um, Derek, I'm just struck by um, these images right now. That was normal up until about six weeks ago. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's just it's just just a reminder of how like crazy the world is and how much it's changed in such a short space of time, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, I, now, yeah, like I'm watching a movie and I'll see some crowd or something. I'm like, oh my god, you know, like I'm I'm already taking a <laughs> people. <laughs> people. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy. Out, you know? Yeah. Crazy. Um, oh. But it looks these like are, the, uh, the restaurant uh, scene is lively there. Yeah, you know, so these are these big, um, like all European cities, particularly in Scandinavia, they have these, uh, you know, massive boardwalks and then downtown, um, just pedestrian boardwalks. And it's, I mean, Aarhus is beautiful. It's much older than Copenhagen. Um, this is the little river that I was telling you about earlier where there's some places along the way it's called it's like a beach where people hang out and that's where people were on friday night like little clusters I was saying there's massive like you know europe in general but certainly scandinavia had massive music festivals um and so you're seeing some of that this is like the ground zero the main cathedral um, this I took a picture of this just on Friday night. This is another place where people can hang out. Um, it's a place that right. So here's the thing. So the rub is that, and all this is beautiful, and all of it is true. Um, but 
the rub is that uh, James, um, you know, very proud of the history, very proud of Viking history, and people here much more like Viking centric and real history than in Copenhagen, because um, it just has it's just been so much entrenched here. There's so there's this thing about, and all you know, all societies have this. But everybody has this like roots. Um, mentality like the Danish roots and we are Danes in the Danish way of life and you know like they really celebrate all this sort of medieval and very early modernity history and all this kind of stuff and um, that's all fine and that's all true but it has this it's very homogeneous way of thinking about who is a Dane right but of course in the last like all throughout Europe right that in Denmark much more recent you have larger visibility of people who are coming from Turkey or Syria or Lebanon or Palestine. Um, and um, and so, or Somalia, and particularly like so, um, that are visibly Muslim that um, have been here, many have born here, we're now into you know, second, third generation, we're talking like 60s, so second generation and um, are never considered Dane when they speak Danish they're perfect they, you know everything but it's this that's the rub you know so um, while most people assume that I'm Danish and because I, you're white because I'm white and um, yeah and I don't have any sort of visible like manifestation of, um, of being Muslim or anything like that and my Danish is really poor. I don't know a lot of the current events. I don't know any of the celebrities. I don't know any of this stuff. Um, where all these other people who are so much more, of course, they're Danes, but they're just not considered so much. So I'm interested in how that's working spatially against cities, and particularly at night, because I think the night is understudied in scholars and like scholarship like what's the distinctiveness about night economies or night um, how people use the city and think about themselves vis-a-vis -vis the night so particularly you right you want to go out this is me i love orhus i want to be part of orhus orhus is cool what does that look like spatially and that's what i'm trying to get at but also you know kind of um the background of all this is the sort of uh, the politics of immigration. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. I mean, the, the footage you showed me, um, what struck me is how white it was. Everyone in that footage was yeah. white. And yeah. I lived in France near Toulouse for years, and I feel that there's a similar situation there. Um, there are lots of French Algerians uh, living in that area, and they have been there for you know a couple of generations, but the same thing. I feel that they aren't totally considered French, even though they've been born in France, they speak fluent French, far better French than I do. And so it, it's funny, I can see some similarities there between Denmark and France. Um, tell me about hip hop and rap and your interest in that genre of music and why that ties into your studies with migrants. Um, so you're right. So this interest goes back a long way. Um, I mean, as a like a fan, whatever, 30, whatever, a long time ago um, in the US. And then I started to, uh, in the mid 90s, um, I was in Texas and I was doing a master's degree in ethnomusicology, so like music and anthropology. And at that time, the first book written in English that was about rap and hip hop came out called Black Noise. And when that book came out, um, it was kind of a sign to me that like, um, you know what, actually people are serious, are writing about this and I could maybe do that. So then I, you know, I did my master's degree, but I, I needed, I didn't want to stay in the US and I wanted to go somewhere else. And this is like soon thereafter is when I met Eddie because I think we met in like the end of 95 or early 1996 because I just decided to go to Brazil on kind of a whim. And 
uh, I ended up staying there for a few years. And I had this very vague idea that, I mean, I knew something about, I mean, everybody knows something about Brazilian music. It's one of the biggest exports. And, and people, that's like one of the first things that people associate with Brazil. But it, I had never heard of Brazilian rap. And this guy came to Texas and he, he held up this vinyl album by one of these early Brazilian rap groups called Cambio Negro. And um, I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. I wanted to know more about that. And I ended up spending a few years and this started generating these sort of questions like how can people, um, can people express themselves through something really uh, about narratives and rhetoric like that? You know, they often say where they are. And so the place where people are from, where they are right now, where they want to be is very important. And that got me thinking about these theoretical things about how we make presence in the world and how that's a part of who we are. And so those kind of what percolated like over the years and they led to different projects. And that, you know, just led me to one of the central questions of this the project that I was just describing to you about. And while um, rap and hip hop and other kinds of music aren't at the foreground in this particular part project, the way they were 20 some odd years ago, I mean, like my dissertation and all that kind of stuff, they're still always there because, um, you know, like the people who I meet and they, they either listen or they practice or they think of themselves as rappers as a way to express themselves. So it often will come, um, it comes to the fore um, at some point. But, but why, Derek, why rap or why hip hop? Oh, why why yeah. not, you know, like, like um, I don't know, um, country or pop? Why, why is it that rap and hip hop really kind of um, encapsulates, um, you know, someone's emotions, especially, you know, as you're looking into maybe people that have gone through, you know, a lot of stuff in life. Right. I mean, for me, like, uh, I was a, I was drawn to rap and hip hop because um, I was always, and I am still like a very shy person for the most part, and like I really, um, looked up to people who were so confident, you know, and they were very, and they were very assertive and they were aggressive and they wanted to convince you that what they're saying is true. And I just had, I was like, that's, I need this. This is something important for me that I think that I can, um, I want to take on some of that, you know, some of that persona and some of that energy. And I think that, um, a lot of people, are attracted to rap and hip hop for similar kinds of reasons. Like they, you're looking for an idiom to express yourself so that you can convince someone that what you're saying is true and that you know something, you have some authority about something. And when you are often, you know, stigmatized for various reasons or you're put down, it makes a lot of sense, right? This is the kind of music that, this is the kind of cultural idiom that I'm looking for because now I have all these years where people are now famous from this. Whereas like a long time ago, people didn't consider it music or culture and so on. Now you've got all these stamps of approval of success and some kind of authority of knowledge and you know, real and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's really powerful and it's really empowering. And I think that that says a lot to a lot of different kinds of people from different walks of life. Yes. Which artists do you like? Who have you admired over the years? Um, so, uh, so this is all like my son got me into. There was this period where I was getting too old and I wasn't keeping up with it and he was way too young, but now he's doing all this data mining and I listened and I kind of make some selections. So, um, I am really, I really like this guy named, um, JPEG Mafia is a great name. JPEG Mafia is from a lot of places, but he calls Baltimore his home. And he's a really interesting guy because he is incredibly performative. I saw him in Copenhagen and I went with my son, Andre, he was like 13 or 14. 
So he was definitely the youngest, and I was by far the oldest person in this place. And there was only like a hundred people in there. And he was like, I thought I've never seen some somebody perform so much of himself. He was like putting it all out there, and in every way, like he is. If you listen to it at the very beginning, you might, it might come off to you as just like another hyper masculine performance but if you stay a little bit more with it you realize that he is pushing all kinds of gender and sexuality boundaries and i think that that's really cool and i like the sound as well he does all his own production and it's not like these days the big the most popular kind of um, beat is like trap there's all these trap rap artists that have they have a particular kind of um, sound like you would recognize it um, and he has some of those elements but he's much more creative than that so i think he's so he's somebody who i've been listening to a lot so derek um i am actually a big rap and hip-hop fan um and i started listening to that type of music when i was kind of maybe 14 15 and i really quite got into it in the late 90s when i would have been like 18 19 um but you know what like now when i listen back to what i used to listen to so you know dr dre snoop dogg um mm. eminem as a mum to two girls i feel a lot of it uncomfortable with some of the lyrics now and i wouldn't want my daughters listening to those lyrics and um, how do you think like rap and hip-hop has evolved and maybe um has it become more inclusive and less kind of misogynistic and sexist yeah, it's, that's its biggest challenge um, because there's a lot of guys that are, um, they just don't, that's part of like the, what can I say? Like, um, you know, like when you're, when you are learning to play like a classical instrument or you're learning to play jazz and you have to have the scales and you have to know all these key signatures and show people that you have mastered that. So like a lot of these guys are like, they have to have this machista, like ultra sexist lyrics as like a proof, like I know that I can do that. And that's- so why, why are you that, Where did that come from? <laughs> but I mean, I think it comes from, I mean, I think it comes from a certain expression of, of uh, bravura, you know, like, um, of a, it's a kind of masculinity, but I will say that I think it has changed. Um, and I mean, there are so like, um, what's the, I don't know if you've heard, there's a, there's a, it was a group and now it's kind of splintered, but there's this um, woman, her name, is, well, it's like the internet, but it's basically this woman and she's pretty popular pretty amazing because often like the the women who become popular often reinforce not always um so you remember like queen latifah was like very progressive in the early 90s and then was pushing different boundaries and that was pretty cool but a lot missy of it elliott, missy elliott was also um you know oh, yeah. she was pretty prominent wasn't she um certainly when um in the late 90s when in early 2000s yeah absolutely so but often the women that rise to the top in, in popularity often reinforce a lot of the kind of these masculinist fantasies and stuff like that. But I think it's, I think it's better. It's, I think there's more room for stories that didn't, they would never have existed. They didn't exist. I never didn't exist in 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And that's why I was saying that I kind of like JPEG Mafia for this reason, because he he really like um, and I, and because I saw him live, I think it was it's not just studio um, whatever calisthenics that I felt like it was kind of real what he does, uh, pushing these boundaries and making people think about what it is to be a black male you know, something like that. And then it's not this one, it's not these couple of stories. There's stories that 
they overlap. You know, he in this way, he, I think he's very queer because he really is interested in getting out of these little checking boxes and stuff. Those boxes aren't real, you know. And I think that that that's why I really like him beyond the aesthetic part. Right? So, yeah. It's interesting. And then they're obviously like white rappers. And um, someone who I think is great is uh, Macklemore. I think his lyrics are really positive. I really like him. And um, but is there still that um, kind of um, sense that hip hop and rap artists should be black and they should come from the Bronx or somewhere, you know, and have had a really tough life? Or is there more space now for, you know, white artists or maybe more women, people that may be from kind of like, average middle class backgrounds i mean you know where is all of that going yeah um it's a it's a difficult question it's there's a politics of representation right there's a thing about like the whole kind of history of different musical forms and cultural forms overall that were initiated by initiate of people of african descent or people for basically non-white black and brown people that forge different avenues, they make incredibly creative, and then they're taken up and kind of commodified um, at other levels of income and, and profit by white people. So there's a, that's, you know, every, we all know this, these histories of the genres that became national, global music phenomena and all that. And so there's, that's important context when we think about somebody like, um, yeah, like Eminem or Macklemore, but you know, or I mean, the guy who I think is an awesome lyricist is um, Aesop Rock. He's like incredible. I'm sure that people probably are writing some dissertation about this guy's lyrics. He has like all these layers, like I mean, really, really, um, just really complex rhyming schemes and all this, and different references to things um that's that's quite impressive but i think that um i mean a lot of these these a lot of the white rappers they they're very acutely aware of all that you know that history and they are just trying to show skills and then at the end of the game and you know at the end of the day most guys in rap will be like you know if you have the skills then you show that then you get this respect you know so and i think ultimately that's you know what everyone is out but they're looking for that um and interesting um why is it that hip-hop is embraced by kind of lots of different people across all um areas of society like you know i was the you know working middle class um white girl from a very stable background i was into it you know how does it kind of like reach people from all backgrounds yeah um <laughs> You know, it's like, I think hip hop, like all kinds of music and, and art, they, they can reach people for different reasons, right? They can send different messages. People like take it up and get attracted um, to it for different reasons, right? So like, um, you know, one, one way that rap and hip hop touches so many people is, not the lyrics, none of that. It's just the beat. It's just like it makes you move and people love that, you know. And so nobody cares what they're saying. A lot of people are like, I don't care what they're saying. I mean, <laughs> I, I was, um, so when I got to Brazil, there was this rap group that was becoming popular and now they're legendary called Hasunice MCs, like the rational MCs. And they went on and they're super famous. The guy who started it, Mono Brown has become, he is he's like an icon. He is incredibly popular to this day. He's my age. And um, the thing about it, though, is that while everything that they, all their lyrics were about being from the peripheral neighborhoods and like, you know, poverty and police brutality and, you know, all this kind of heavy reality, really heavy stuff. The, a lot of the people, they realized, the group realized that they could go to some of these more posh neighborhoods and their shows would blow up. It's like all these, like, you know, white Brazilian, you know, upper, upper class, middle class. 
who they are putting down, you know, who they're calling playboy, you know, ridiculous guy, whatever, with all this, you know, who is oppressing us and stuff like that. But they'll go to those shows because they just like the beat. They just loved it, you know, they just really, this is great, you know, I love you, lots of nice MCs, you guys are awesome, you know, like that. So this is all to say that, and there's a lot of things in between, and that's just about class and race, but, you know, art and music can speak to people on so many different levels, and that's all, and it's valid, you know. Human beings take different kind of signs and images and sound, and we make our own meanings out of it. And that's why art, you know, an artist can say, I really meant to say this, I meant it to be like this, but you can't control the meaning of a piece of art, so. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I'm definitely a fan of the beat. And I've just got a funny story I've got to share. And so I also used to like Cypress Hill. And there was one time when, um, so this would have been in the 90s, I'm probably about 15 years old, my brother would have been about 12 or 13. And we're in the car, so it's my brother, myself, my dad, and we were going to collect my mum from her job. So my dad was a police officer and my mum was a probation officer. And at the time she worked in um, the local jail. And so we're driving to collect my mum and I've got this little like cassette tape of Cypress Hill and I tell my dad to, to put it on. And um, he obviously wasn't listening to the lyrics at first. And then uh, I can't remember which song it was, but there was some kind of anti-police lyrics and obviously lots of expletives. And he was horrified. I thought it was like hilarious. And the, you know, it was like, oh, ah. you know, I just played something with swearing on and that said, you know, something the police. But anyhow, so that just, that just popped back into my head. My head. Um, but so, so I'm interested because with all due respect, um, like, you know, you don't necessarily look like a guy who is kind of gangster or into rap music, and neither do I, so we're on the same page there. But the reason I'm asking you this is because how are you received when, you know, you travel around the world, you work in loads of different places, when people realize, you know, what you are a professor of or what your interests are, how are you received? Yeah, um, so this is the thing about, for me, like anthropology, and field work is a long process. Um, so, you know, it takes a while to kind of get behind um, the veneer of people. You know, it's so like I was talking about, we were talking about podcasts when he invited me to do this. And he was talking about that, you know, one of these, the famous guy, whatever he has, I think I think he has the most popular podcast, right? Uh, Joe Rogan or something. And they had, yeah, yeah. And he had this, he has this like a uh, philosophy or something. These long, these long podcasts that you cannot, no one can put up their little front for more than you know forty five minutes. You know, it will start to break down, and you get to see someone, the genuine person, right? So if you kind of extrapolate that a little bit to like, you know, months and months where you're hanging out with someone. Of course, a lot of people put up resistance um, to me, for, and I completely understand that, you know. But there's always some people who are like curious or like, you know, what are you doing? And like, who are you? And what is your story? You know? And then like, because I want to know their story. And then they're like, why should I tell you my story? And then they say, like, well, you know, I'm interested. And if you just kind of, after a while, and you keep coming, you keep going, you keep like kind of showing up and participating and trying to do something collaborative, you know, over time, there's, again, it's like that thing about respect and um, people will go beyond like the surface, you know. And I, but it's, but ultimately there is this, Kind of like what we we're talking about with white rappers, same thing with like white scholars talking about black and brown people is a very difficult um, negotiation to do. And I've been, I think about this a lot and sometimes I fall down and I make mistakes about how, make mistakes at least to me and, and um, people call me out and say like, what are you doing? Why, how can you say that? And sometimes, you know, you have to check yourself and that's, I think, part of the, part of the process that I, 
there's a political part to it and there's an aesthetic part to it. So like I've been, I think about a lot of different ways to represent um, the realities that I, that I hang out in or I listen in and on or, you know, participate in some way. So I've been trying to, I try to go beyond the typical kind of scholar, conventional scholarly article or a, a monograph and think about different ways of creatively representing um, what I observe. And, and uh, I like to think that these are ways that people would also, especially like someone who's an artist or a rapper or somebody who's a graffiti artist, something like that, it's kind of, sometimes they see that as like an, uh, uh, an effort on my part in my own little way to do something beyond the typical, like I'm trying to meet them, you know what I mean? Um, but it is, it's, it's a question that doesn't go away with the questions that you're asking are not ones that are really um, resolved or quickly resolved, it's, it's this process. Huh. Now, I want you to just take me back to the beginning, because where are you from originally? Um, I was born in Alabama, and all my family is from the South, the Deep South. And, uh, but I grew up on a, in a beach city called Virginia Beach, Virginia, so on the Atlantic coast. And, uh, and I, but none of my family is from there. And um, once I was a teenager, then um, my mother and my father well, they separated and they all they both moved back to the south. So I have nothing in Virginia. It was the place that I grew up and was a teenager. And then I went on to college and I moved in different places of the country. Um, last, I lived on the east coast and the west coast. I lived in St. Louis for a long time. So I've been all around the U.S. And then, <laughs> and I lived in Brazil for several years as well. Yeah, so, so tell me though, how did you get to Brazil? And you met my producer Edward there. You and him are friends, aren't you? Yeah, um, we met. I mean, I just watched. Um, I watched you guys talk. You guys talked to Tony like a few days ago or something like that, or last yes. week. Yeah, yeah. And I know Tony. Um, and when I was listening to it, I realized that. We all three met around the same time because when I was listening at the beginning, I, could, um, I knew they had already met each other, but I came in a little later, but not that much later than what Tony kind of describes. So um, that was cool listening to Tony because I haven't heard from him for a long time. So it was, it was interesting to hear about what's going on with, in his life. Um, so what were you doing in Brazil? So when I was in Texas, I was talking to you before, um, that uh, towards the end of my master's program there, this guy from um, Brazil, a professor in anthropology, an anthropologist, he gave this talk and it was so fascinating to me in a lot of parts of Brazil that I hadn't heard about from my other classes, like in Latin American culture and music and stuff. And I was, I was just, I was already playing like Bossa Nova, like the typical conventional U.S. bingo story. And, but I had not heard these stories from Brazil. And I was like, this guy's amazing. Um, I want to go meet him when he goes back to Brazil. And he, like typical uh, Brazilian, was like, oh, yeah, come on by, you know, just stop by, you know, it'll be fine. And I kept that in my mind. We had this conversation. I kept that in my mind and when I finished my masters I just left and went to Brazil and I looked this guy up. I went to Brasilia. So I was in Sao Paulo for a couple of days, got on a bus for like a thousand kilometers away, go to the capital city. He's not there. But he left <laughs> he's not there at all. He's not even in he's Oh like, my god. He so, wasn't there at all. So, so you so you travel all the way like to the Brazil to meet this guy and he wasn't even there. He wasn't there, but he, um, you know, this is all before, you know, people had email, but not really, you know, this is mid nineties. So it's not really that common to, you know what I mean, to have that many conversations like that. And 
but he did leave like uh, his graduate student or one graduate student knew that I was might come and so this somehow I got I don't know there was some phone I'm not ex I don't remember exactly but this guy met me he found me and and like the and he put me up in some and I didn't understand anything because my Portuguese is like zero I didn't I went with like no classes or anything and all I remember is that um you know, this guy, George, he wasn't there. These two grad students who have their own lives, you know, they're not going to babysit me. I mean, what, what, what am I doing here? And I had already, like, uh, met a couple of people in the couple of days that I was in Sao Paulo. I had already met a couple of people that told me that, why are you going to Brazil? You should be here in Sao Paulo because this is the center. Uh, you're interested in that and all that. You shouldn't go to Brazil. You should be here. So I also had that kind of in my mind. And when I, my initial reaction to Brazil was very um, cold, very like it, you know, it repulsed me in some way. Um, and so I home stayed for, I stayed for about 10 days uh, to give it a chance. But it didn't really warm up to me. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of Brasilia, you know, the planned city. So it looks completely different than all the other cities in Brazil and in Latin America. Um, you know, it's a Nehemiah project and like these big sweeping areas of concrete and everything is very lateral, and nothing is very vertical. Um, and it was just weird to me. So I hightailed it back to Sao Paulo. And that's when my. Um, all this experience that I began. And I met, I had to make a living. <laughs> I realized very quickly, I'm sure Ed has these stories as well, that, you know, um, when I arrived, the, the, the HAL was one year old, the new currency was one year old. And it was in fact stronger than the dollar. And so, like, I couldn't understand any of the numbers because I had, you know, someone gave me like a 1993, uh, whatever, like Lonely Planet or some tour book, you know, like what we did back then. And there was no real, and nobody looked, I didn't, nobody had any internet, we didn't know any of that stuff. So I was basing my entire, like, knowledge of, like, practical things about Brazil on something that was 1993 before this new currency. So I thought that like with my $400 or something, I would be like the king, I would be, everything is great. And I realized it was worth you know, very little. It's like even worth less than a dollar. So I quickly had to figure out a way to make a living. And after a couple of weeks, some, I don't remember exactly, but some months after that whole adventure is when I um, met Ed uh, in one of these schools that he and Tony were remin reminiscing about it in the last, when you were interviewing him. So, oh, that's, uh, that's funny. So, um, you're a professional, I'm getting a note from Edward right now. You're apparently um, professional Americans. We're, <laughs> we're professional Americans. <laughs> the gringo industry? Sorry, I'm getting a barrage of texts from Edward right now. Okay. I hope this is making sense to you. I'm just doing what I'm told. I'm repeating them to you. So, I'm yeah, sorry. You... Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll come in and, and claim it. Yeah. I, should, I should go to the chat part. Or something. No, it's just, I was saying, Derek, so in Brazil, there's, and I, and it's probably in reflection that I describe it that way, but there's, there's definitely a gringo industry to be a professional American and go into these classes, business classes and speak English oh, and yeah, yeah. idioms and just to be around first world products like ourselves. Yeah, and I was very poor at um, capitalizing on it because I wasn't interested in that. I was interested, in that. <laughs> but I did the minimum so that I could live okay. And that's one thing that I always describe you as. You were the first and last American I met there. I think I told you this. That wasn't part of the uh, three reasons that Americans find themselves in Brazil, which is either belonging to the company, uh, being with a significant other and giving a whirl 
or being a missionary at a church. And I think I asked you that when I first met you, and he go, you said, I just want to be here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, so you met your wife there as well, didn't you? Yeah. So, just like Edward. Edward, you met your wife there too. But yeah, I so actually met her there. here. She was My wife was, was studying her master's here. Oh, of course that was it. But then your wife has got she is Brazilian though, your wife, isn't it? Isn't she? Yes, but I'm such a I'm such a ass backwards person that I met my Brazilian wife here <laughs> and then we went to Brazil and lived there for a while and all the time everybody asking me, Why are you here? You're married a Brazilian woman, you should be living in the United States. Oh, that's funny. So Derek, so you met your wife there, and then, and then what, well, where did you, you know, did you stay there? Did you move on? Like, what happened? Um, so I stayed there for a few years to the end of the 90s. And then um, it's during this time that uh, this, just kind of doing this sort of vague field work project about rap and hip hop and getting to know the periphery neighborhoods. I thought that I needed to, I really wanted to go back to school to do a PhD and had this drive. So when I was in my master, when I was doing masters, I lost a lot of like, I wasn't that interested in reading this academic literature. And I was, I was really wanted like experience. But after a few years, I wanted to go back and I, convinced Selma to go back with me and she ended up doing a PhD in literature. Um, and so we went back with this sort of drive, like we were motivated to go and to the, do the whole academic thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so then it came back to the US, but every year since then, at least a month and sometimes longer, we go to Brazil. So. If it's and then and then ju just quickly, how did you then get to where you are now? How have you you know moved to Denmark? What happened there? Oh, that's so <laughs> um, yeah. And then fast forward many many years, and um, there was a job announcement in this department that was so actually. So I, as you you introduced me as um, a professor in the Department of Global Studies. Inside the Global Studies is sort of an umbrella department. It's interdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary and there are different world areas that are represented. So within the Global Studies, there's China Studies and Japan Studies and Russian Studies and South Asia, India, South Asia Studies, and there's also Brazilian Studies. And so I got this um, Selma actually forwarded me this job announcement that to be in this global studies interdisciplinary and I was very I had um, a kind of up and down roller coaster relationship with anthropology and um, what I do as much kind of goes into different disciplines so I thought this would be a great opportunity um, yeah, and how? Because obviously you 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 know you moved around. You've been in Brazil. How does Denmark compare to the other places that you've lived? Right. So um, it's it's like the it's so far away from Brazil to me. It's like the I mean, Brazil and the U.S. are quite different, you know. But Brazil and Denmark are really really. Different. It's the other side, uh, for better, for worse, for all the good things, all the bad things. It's just so the opposite side, um, opposite part of the spectrum. And again, like for good, so like, you know, the, the, I'm a, a little bit reminded when I was listening to Tony talk as well, this like contrast between Australia and Brazil and his wife, like, uh, transitioning he himself transitioning back to a place that he hadn't been in whatever 25 30 years or something like that um you know even more so i think denmark is incredibly planned you know so like i i i'm a cities guy i'm very interested in cities um, i edit a journal that's about urban studies and so i pay a lot of attention to urban planning and it's incredible you know, these bike lanes and 
everything is just so well organized in this way that you know you have to you know, tip your hat to that because it's quite amazing i i'm like i there i'm really like taken aback by it. They're, they're doing some development towards the more of orchids and this is complete you would never see this in brazil and you would never see this in the u.s either it's like they put transportation at first you know, they put all this public transportation rails and stuff trains out there and right now there's like these couple of stops where you're like why is there a stop here because there's nothing there but they know that they're going to develop residential and commercial real estate there but right now there's like nothing at this stop so like they put like this infrastructure before people rather than like you know it's all haphazard in some following and you know, people will just have to start for various reasons are pushed into like trying to find a place to live there's no infrastructure for them out there and they have to like you know appeal and then gradually it comes in and it's not very well done and you know all that kind of stuff happens. and here's like completely the opposite I mean, it's like plan um yes I mean, yeah. I mean, certainly, obviously, I'm, I'm originally from the UK. I lived in France, and now I'm living here in the US. And I think the transportation system across Europe in general is, is just far superior to the one here. Um, so I totally, I totally get what you're saying about, um, you know, the train system in Denmark. It's quite similar to the UK by the sounds of things. Um, but what, like, specific cultural shocks did you experience, you know, moving to Denmark, having lived, obviously, in Brazil and being from the US? Um, so let's see, I mean, there are many things, um, some things like, uh, I could echo things that Tony said about like, um, people being, um, you know, people are very warm and inviting in Brazil. I think that's true for the most part. It's very easy to strike up a conversation, you know, and here it's extremely difficult. Uh, I have some of my students who are. And this is even among Danes, right? So like some of my students, they're Danish and we are chatting about groups and like whatever, what they do on the weekend or something like that. And many of the people tell me how even, you know, they're not, um, it's so difficult for them to like kind of branch out outside of some smaller social cliques or whatever, like to get into another group is incredibly difficult and um, when they go to like, a larger classroom so like they'll have classes with me and it's smaller just say brazilian you know, just, just brazilian studies but some of these students will go into larger global studies classes and it's just hard to break these barriers so this is something that is i, I observe and i experience i it's very difficult for me to make um danish friends and uh, so almost all my friends are international people. Um, that's quite, that's somewhat difficult, a big contrast, I would say. Um, but there's things yeah. like- How is your Danish, by the way? Do you speak Danish? Uh, very good. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty poor. Um, I can understand some stuff like, okay, read it much better. You know, German helps, I studied German for many years, um, used to be decently proficient, but that helps a lot with reading. Uh, but the pronunciation is just so difficult, and and you know you know this like in particularly in Northern Europe and, and even more in Scandinavia, the percentage of people that speak English and, and speak English very well is like you know above nine percent. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. You know? So there's like Every time I try to speak Danish, people immediately code switch and go into English. So there's not a lot of, you know, motivation. <laughs> there's not a lot of like uh, inviting, which is another thing so different for different reasons. But like in Brazil, everyone is like, if you even try, you're trying to speak Portuguese. They're like, oh, you're so good. You're amazing. You're Portuguese. So good. And you feel good, like as you're just trying, and, and you know your Portuguese is horrible, right? But you're trying, and that gives you this, like, oh, 
Part of it is because they don't speak any other language, so they have to endure your culture. But also, it's I, I found that in France, though, if you know, I mean, I was in an area where they didn't speak any English, like even the principal at my daughter's school didn't speak a word of English, so I had to speak French. And you know, yeah. my French isn't great, but they, um, you know, they were really enthusiastic. Just the fact that I was trying was kind of good enough for them. So they'd say, oh, you know, you speak beautifully. Oh, no, I didn't speak beautifully, but yeah, I, so I hear you. That encouragement's nice, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah, so you don't, you don't get that that much here. Some things, um, it's really weird. I, it's, um, this experience here has made me uh, rethink a lot of things that I took for granted. I mean, every time you go to another society, another culture, it does that, right? Which I think is good, right? It's a growing experience. Not always comfortable, but there's no doubt that you know, I've kind of expanded like my idea of humanity and even at daily life and stuff. And uh, so like, for example, um, one thing that I've always been critical of since I was a teenager, since I like started thinking about anything socially was hierarchy. You know, I always hated hierarchy. I always thought that this is horrible thing that societies have and um, both the U.S. and in Brazil, I mean, Brazil, it's even, it's incredibly visible the hierarchies that are there. And when you come to a place like Denmark that prides itself on um, egalitarian society and, uh, you know, they like to, to, they take pride in this. So like, you know, so you see the father and the mother, father does a lot of things that in many societies would be considered like women's work and child rearing. And but like what? A, Give us an example. Like, like, um, you know, pushing the buggy and like taking care of the little, of the infant while the, the mother is doing something else, you know, and you see that all the time and you see these things that, or when they're together and still the, the father will do all these things that normally you would see conventionally, like in Brazil or the US for sure. You would, it would be like, oh, that, that's a, such a great guy. Oh my God. You know, and here it's like completely normal. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, there are there are big differences, and um, certainly uh, in the US compared to Europe. And but how is Andreas? How is your son adapting? So um, Andre, he came a little bit. So I came first, and then some a semester or so later, Andre came, and then a semester after that, Selma came. So we kind of staggered here, and he um, it took him a a while, a really long time. And that's why I was saying earlier about how the social part of the school is so important in his case, because he, um, and I have to fill in some of this gaps real quick, because he was here for a few years and he really struggled with the social part. He couldn't meet anybody. It was very difficult, you know, um, for him to make any friends let alone Danish friends, um, very difficult for him. And he just sort of went through the academic stuff, but he wasn't that happy socially. In the very end, um, the last, uh, like about a year ago, he started to make really, really good friends. Um, and even like one or two of these people were Danish, so he was like all excited. But at the same time, he, we had decided, and he was the engineer of this decision or this process, is that he really wanted to go to some other school because his school was going to end here, and then you would have to go basically to it's there's a it's a particular kind of educational system in Denmark, but after like the the equivalent of, equivalent of the tenth grade, you have to kind of go to this other school. And other schools these last two years it will be high school but there are many different options that you can do in Denmark and so his school was going to end and he was going to have to go somewhere most probably outside the city and 
this got him going into thinking that maybe he could get a scholarship and go to a boarding school because the ultimate goal was for him to go to the university in the U.S. Um, and so we actually made that happen and he was going and he went. But right when this time happened is when he started to make friends and he started to this will answer your question about he started to feel more at home socially here but it had already you know he decided it's like you know murphy's law he had already we already committed and so this past fall he started a boarding school in the u.s um and he had to start all over again with his social part so you know i guess that again you know going back to school will kind of ease a lot of those anxieties for your son yeah, definitely. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know. I mean, I was, I've been talking, you know, I'm sure we're all like um, messaging each other and having Zoom videos and, you know, people talk about, it's the level that what are you going to do today? Like, what am I doing today is about as much as I can handle. Because if I start thinking about, I don't know what school is going to be like, you know. I don't know what education is going to be like. And if I, when I start thinking about too far in the future, it becomes incredibly overwhelming and paralyzing. So I, I mean, I, I exchange this all the time, just like, you know, kind of take a day at a time. That sounds kind of cliche, but I feel like it's actually helping me. And um, I hope that I just don't know what it's going to be like. And I don't, want to it's so important for him. he's at this moment all these kids you know what is their school going to be like? what is education going to be like you know, i don't know but i i hope that it will normalize and he can um pick up where he left off and um he's doing great stuff he's a great kid and uh yeah, I hope all these kids that are like seniors now and like well, they're trying to transition to college and all that. And what is that? I, yeah. I, mean, I, I feel it's really tough. It really is. I mean, my sixth grader, that's her last year at elementary school. She's going to middle she's, school in September. Right. And so she's missing out on lots of sixth grade stuff. She's devastated about that. I think my girls assume that when they go back to school, it's going to be like the old times, like school as they know it. But like you say, Derek, I mean, what will education look like after this? Yeah, I don't know. Um, nobody really knows. Everybody's just sort of um, playing out different scenarios and, you know, taking, investing in technology. But as we, I think that we both kind of agreed earlier on that it facilitates certain things like our conversation today and all that, but you know, it's not the same. Well, can I just say, um, touching upon education, I have never seen a more extensive or impressive CV as yours. Um, I mean, I just made a few notes and I was looking through it, that you've obviously got a PhD, you've got numerous master's degrees, you've written books. Oh my goodness, you, you certainly aren't someone who sits on their bum, are you? <laughs> no. Um, no, and I was thinking about, uh, and everybody, there's this, I'm sure you've probably seen some of these memes, like how do people deal with the pandemic, you know? And one of those like categories is like, is these people who are like, I've got to learn, you know, Swahili, you know, I'm going to learn this and like feeling like anxious and they're like hyper productive. And I'm not really, I feel like I'm like super lazy, um, but I feel like that, uh, there's so many people saying stuff that this is the small people want to feel relevant you know and you know just everyone's searching you guys are doing this podcast which is amazing and you transition into the pandemic time and it's just thinking about ways to like be out there, like do something like be there be out there and contribute in some way and uh you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about what can I do, what, what can be done, what, what is like that fits me, you know, like my personality and what I know and what I think I can do. Um, so, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I 
Well, listen, you know, you are a really inspirational person and, and I love that you kind of, you know, you're embracing the times, you're evolving with it and you're trying to kind of look at the positives. So that's great. And that's, you know, I really respect that. Thank you. Um, well, listen, Derek, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for, you know, giving me your time today. Um, and incidentally, what time is it in Denmark right now? Um, it's uh, about 20 to 8 p.m. Okay, so and it's kind of, yeah, it's about 20 to 11 in the morning here. So, yes, yeah, so you're about um, nine hours ahead. Is, is my math yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I gotta go okay. make some dinner. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, like, what? who knows what day of the week it is right now? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Saturday is like a Tuesday. Like, a, the girls will say to me, Oh, is it so and so tomorrow when I'm tucking them in at night? I'm like, oh, let me just double check my cup. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is so tomorrow. <laughs> well, Derek, listen, you take care. Send um, you know my best wishes to your family. I hope you know we're back to some sort of normal life soon. Um, and thanks again for today. It's been an absolute joy speaking with you. Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks for the opportunity to chat a little bit, and good luck with the podcast and everything else that you're doing. Um, going forward. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Take care. Yeah. Bye. You too. Bye. Take care.